Hello and welcome ladies and gentlemen to a Premier League presentation. I'm Blaze. We're going to be bringing you guys a game between Team Liquid and Mouse Sports. This is going to be a best of three series here and I'm very excited. I haven't seen these uh, two teams in action in a decent bit of time so it's, it's nice to see them uh, back in uh, the driver's seat here are going to be going up against each other for this best of three series and uh, yeah of course this is game one so we're going to get kicked off myself and Vikramon are going to be the ones casting on in here but now we're on into the draft I'm, I'm raring to see what these guys have to bring to the table because uh, the most of the most of the past couple weeks have been spent uh, them adapting and them uh, really really changing up their styles to move in towards something new something fresh something that uh, will be able to accomplish a lot of things whether when they will look towards G1 leagues qualifiers trying to throw people up there to get a slot there or right here Premier League RDL uh, or sorry our rate called D2L and Starlighter just finishing up everybody's kind of trying to bring something new to the table and uh, these two guys are no exception so uh, once again I I'm Blaze and uh, I'm gonna be bringing on Vikramond here how's it going man it's going well I'm excited to see these two teams again Blaze because the last uh, week or so has really been a lot of games with uh, basically the same three or four teams and we've seen a lot of Empire, Fnatic, No Tide Hunter, Dignitas, what have you. But actually, uh, Mouse and Liquid haven't had that many games. I did watch a game with uh, Liquid recently. They were on the We Play League about a day or two ago, and they seemed on form. But they were facing, you know, teams that are vastly, um, you know, less practiced and less uh, high up on a professional level than they are. But uh, Mouse Sports, another team that sort of uh, hasn't had a, the greatest time lately. They had this sort of uh, tough day about a week or two ago where they just lost three series in a row and it just seemed like they didn't have their heads in the game really. But they've had a lot of time to regroup, so uh, I think we might sort of see them come back here and pull out something out of their hat. Yeah, that'll be really, really interesting. As far as the, the rankings go right Ten now, Team Liquid remaining. is by far ahead of the pack. They're no, ranked number one. Uh, they are Five just cruising to remaining. really, really smoothly run into a playoff slot, very, very well secured. Actually, in fact, this will be the first game of the tournament that will secure a team 100% in the playoffs, uh, assuming they do win this game here. But they're going to have to fight for it. Mouse Sports still wants to show what they've got here. They technically also have a sliver of hope as far as going on into these playoffs. They would have to take this game and their next one and Empire would have to take considerable losses as well as I believe No Tide but uh, it's still technically possible and I uh, always want to uh, give that hope and uh, kind of go for it, root for the underdog in that circumstance there but uh, interesting draft so far going very very quickly here we do see that the Wisp and the Batrider were banned out by Mass Sports answering back Team Liquid took off the Keeper Light Ten and Nature's Profit remaining. maybe afraid of a little bit of that too much counter push and push uh, mechanics Five but uh, and picking up for themselves Team Liquid has drafted up the Nyx Assassin, Chen and Lifestealer whereas Mouse Sports has drafted themselves the Magnus and the Lone Druid. What do you think about this draft so far? Well, uh, just uh, towards the Nature's Prophet ban, Nature's Prophet right now is a hero that you would never consider first banning except against a couple of teams. And I do think Mouse is one of those teams because uh, it's one of Quaqua's uh, sort of heroes that he's most comfortable with. So, uh, and Mouse have done very well with that sort of split push lineup okay. where uh, their number three will play the Nature's Prophet. He'll do a lot of pushing while Black just gets tons and tons of farm. So I think it's a smart ban by Liquid, especially if they wanted to leave themselves open some additional very strong heroes. You see Lifestealer in this draft making it just a bit later than he usually does. I do, however, like Mouse's lineup as well. They do have this pair of the Rubik and the Magnus, which uh, is almost more of a deny than anything. In addition to Rubik being one of the strongest supports, uh, he's also just excellent enough a team can pick him up against Magnus. So the ability to secure both of them, I think, puts them in pretty good shape so far. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, in their current cir circumstances, I believe that they want to run the Nyx as a support, and along with, of course, the Chen in that role as well. So uh, the Rubik would have had to be solo mid, which is generally considered less favorable. So I'm not sure if they would have picked it up, but it's still something that Mouse Sports have run time and time again. It used to be pretty much the signature hero of Kurokai, so at the very least, Mouse Sports is very, very familiar with playing around that hero, and knowing uh, when he's going to initiate with Telekinesis and stuff like that, and uh, acting responsibly. As far as spell steals, you can see things like Impale and Vendetta being very powerful as well as that Open Wounds. lifestyle has got a couple of tricks up his sleeve, but it's generally going to be of lesser note comparatively, but also not having to worry about that Reverse Polarity getting stolen, as you said, is going to be a, a nice little thing there. But the bands came out very, very fast and furious. This Puck, Darkseer, Tinker taken on out, as well as a bunch of carries from Team Liquid banning out Gyrocopter, Phantom Lancer, and the Antimage. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I like the Puck ban, A, because obviously Korok Puck has 
just led to so many Team Liquid uh, blowouts of teams. These teams actually don't have that much uh, pro game experience against each other. I don't know if they've scrimmed or I'm not really privy to the details of their internals, but we've only seen Maus and Liquid play uh, once or twice head to head and it was a while ago. So I think in, in a draft like this you sort of want to just examine how the other team generally plays, what their sort of approach in a vacuum is, and try to structure your draft against that. So TL, I love these bands from them. They've taken out three good sort of carry heroes that uh, Black plays, and they also drafted one for themselves. Obviously, uh, Maus, when they were riding, I think at, the, at their highest point, Black was just playing Lifestealer 80 to 90% of their games and just putting together some absolutely remarkable performances. So this gives Liquid not only one of the strongest, if not the strongest carry in the pool, it also means that Black doesn't have access to it, nor to Phantom Lance or Anti-Mage or Gyro, which are three other heroes that he also really likes playing. Yeah, so that definitely gives him limiting options there. I mean, they could maybe do a bit of a, a swap up here with Lone Druid being picked yep. up as a number one hero, but uh, it's going to be more and more difficult as the pressure comes on. Chen uh, has a lot of push potential very early on with his Holy Persuasion neutral creeps, and along with that, Bulba on the Clockwork is going to put pressure out here. So we're kind of seeing how this is all going to work itself out. Uh, TC on the Life Stealer uh, would be Fluff on the Chen, and then Ix Mike on the Nyx Assassin. And now we do see Bulba's Clockwork there. So pretty much the last thing they're going to have to look into is Korok Zero. The Puck has been banned, the Tinker has been banned, Ten but their lanes remain. are relatively well rounded out and that puts them in a great position to try to go for Five good pickoffs, try to remain. make sure they're initiating uh, on their terms rather than that of Mouse Sports here. But uh, I really, really think that it's going to come down to what Mouse Sports draft as a carry to decide the pacing. They could go for maybe like an Alchemist for Black, right. or they could realize that they're going to be pressured with the Rocket Flare spam and the Chen Creeps pushing and want to go for something with a little bit more uh, versatility in the early game. I, I think they, they could go with something more of a hard carry, uh, like the Alchemist, who of course comes online a little sooner than some hard carries. There is also mm -hmm. Void. We see Black go up on the Void sometimes, but I honestly think it would be kind of a trap. I would actually love to see Maus uh, just put Black on the Lone Druid, treat that as the number one. And the only problem being, of course, there's not that many heroes that Koiko will feel good about playing still in the pool. Mm -hmm. We live in a world where tri lanes are so hard to actually live through that it's tough to justify taking sort of a, a low tier uh, off lane hero just because they'll either die or you end up needing to put them in the jungle. So they take up the SD. This is good against Lifestealer. Uh, we might see Alchemist, we might see Void. I think Maus need to be careful about how late that carry is going to come online because TL has a lineup that will just easily kill you or gank you. I mean, if they add the Queen of Pain onto this, for instance, uh, that's going to make life hell for, for example, a Faceless Void early on. Uh, there is always that chance that you just backtrack everything, luckily, but you really don't want to be relying on that. Uh, Alchemist, I don't think, would be the worst idea in the world. He does have that stun early. He brings some good early presence. Shadow Demon and Rubik pair up very well with him, because if you start the unstable concoction, then by the time that disruption and telekinesis are done, the, you basically are guaranteed to land it for the full duration. So that's a pretty dangerous lane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in general, there's a lot of potential for what they're looking at here. But uh, yeah, Team Liquid Ten doesn't seem to have remaining. very weak lanes either. I mean, yes, the Chen is jungle, so technically he won't be there uh, pretty much babysitting 24-7. But he'll come in and out. And now with Korok being able to pick up the Storm Spirit here, uh, they have so much potential to put out early aggression. As soon as everybody's sitting around 6, they have long-range initiation with a Clockwork Hook, with the Ball Lightning, two heroes jumping in across with the Hand of God to support them. And then Nyx can get in the, into the mix of things really, really quickly with his Vendetta, and uh, his relatively long-range stuns. So that just leaves Nakes here. If Nakes builds for a movement speed build, I think they can play this lineup completely different than what I would otherwise expect Ten from them. I think they can remain. jump in and just trying to find pickoffs, 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 find Rubik, find Shattered, even uh, caught out, even remain. a lone pick if you can get him in Cog. So in this situation here, the only thing they have to worry about is uh, powerhouse defensive disruptions. If they can, if the initiation can be nullified by disruptions here, then Mouse Sports can really turn things around nicely because they're going to cluster up together, Magnus can find those RPs, but uh, otherwise Team Liquid, I feel, has the upper hands to start things off. Ten seconds. Yeah, absolutely. I think TL has a very, very scary lineup here. They're just going to go in, get kills, have... They do go with the Void. Okay. Um, I, if Black... Can, if Black is a fantastic farmer. Uh, there was a period in which I would say that he was clear-cut the best farmer in, in Europe. Uh, I don't know if it's if it's as big of a dividing line now, but he's still an absolutely excellent at managing to find that farm, getting what he needs. And if it goes very late, 
Uh, Liquid don't actually have anything that can deal with a extremely late game void, um, which they've purposefully done. They knew that there was this possibility. They drafted against it in the respect that early on, Liquid will be very, very scary, especially once Clockwork hits a hookshot. Uh, sorry, he hits the level for hookshot. Mouse Sports are going to be in a lot of trouble because Liquid just have not global initiation power, but damn close to it. The Life Stealer, uh, TC can just sort of jump inside Bulba or Korok here and just jump right out and blow up whoever they're on, even if it's Black's Faceless Void, even if he tries to time walk away. Mm -hmm. It's a very dangerous lineup. And the other thing is, these are just five heroes that all of these Liquid players are just very good on. Uh, Fluff and stuff, he's played Chen quite a bit. Uh, Korok loves Storm Spirit, so I think it's one of his favorite heroes to play up in the middle. And Bulba, he was one of the first Clockworks we actually saw in the Western scene. Like, uh, in terms of, sorry, once Clockworks sort of entered the metagame in a, about a month and a half, two months ago, Bulba was one of the very first players on Western teams who actually used that frequently, and he's excellent at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can tell that these guys are still very, very, uh, yeah, despite the fact that, like you mentioned, they haven't been playing too much uh, professional versus professional games in the past week or so, they're definitely uh, still sharp. They're uh, pretty much raring to go. Uh, coming out, uh, you can see, like, in the first two seconds of the game, Bulba already had received one uh, point of regen from uh, Fluff and Stuff with that Tango, and he was already moving into a good position to make sure that he can fortify himself well in this lane and kind of set up shop there. So they are well rehearsed, they're well, they have their right intentions, and they're going on into this game uh, without any real lethargy. They're definitely wanting to make sure that they make game one count here, and I, I think it'll be an interesting matchup the way this draft is kind of poured out. Like you said, Mouse Sports has a pretty clear cut late game if they can get to it, uh, but Team Liquid is one of those teams that have such an aggressive style that it will be a very limiting factor in the sense that they're going to try to make sure that cannot happen. Now for the laning phase, both of them looking at defensive tri lanes, whether 2.5 in the sense of Liquid or 3-1-1 uh, in the sense of Mouse Sports, but either way, uh, the carries are going to get farmed is the bottom line. Faces Void, a Black starting off with a Quelling Blade and a Stout Shield is going to be able to get pretty much uncontested last hits here while Bulba will just try to survive. And uh, you can pretty much say the same thing for TC and the Life Stealer here, where he's only going to be going up against that Lone Druid. It can be frustrating uh, when the supports start roaming to go one versus one up against the Lone Druid, but uh, with the supports at his back, I, I think they can accomplish a lot. And right now, Koikwa's already uh, lost a couple of trunks off his bear, just trying to scout on around. Right. Early on, I think one important thing to look out for will be how do these two offlane heroes perform? So how does Bulba do on the clock? How does Koikwa do on the Lone Druid? They're both quite important to the actual outcome of the game for their respective teams. Uh, for Maus, they need Koikwa to get a decent amount of development in the early to mid game to do counter pushing and to provide some sort of threat in team fights until Black is well developed. Mm -hmm. And for Liquid, uh, Bulba is really key to their initiation power and their ability to actually score the kills that they want, especially on Black. Uh, like you said, I don't think there's any actual danger. Danger on mid. Alex will pop up the disruption going in for this. Skiri here puts Korok in a really bad spot early on, and with pauses. Uh Telekinesis are actually going to be able to pull them back, dish out a ton of damage, a couple more right clicks will go their way, and without any other misses, they will get the first blood onto pause here. So that invisibility room from Alex, just biding his time a little bit, but Korok apparently wasn't informed, despite it being taken right underneath the ward, he was right down in the river, and that sealed his fate there. Yeah, that's interesting, because Korok surely knew, not only was there a ward, Bulbo was standing, or uh, IX Mike was standing there as well. I, I think it's just a matter of you can't play scared forever, and he yeah. figured, oh, they probably went to their tri lane already. Exactly, but uh, yeah, that's very, very unfortunate for him because in that time window they were able to just kind of chill out, set it up, and that gives a huge advantage early on. Now it is Rubik that got the early gold, but that just sets it up so he can pick. Uh, he has his boots now, has plenty of consumables to work with, and uh, Fada gets a nice uh, experience advantage as well for himself. About to pick up his bottle actually, and I'm assuming the flying courier will be coming up pretty shortly as well. But right now it has been kind of a one versus one matchup between Bulba and Black here. Do you feel that they should be letting Bulba get pretty much his uh, free reign on this top lane here? Well, it's a trade-off. They want to keep oh, Korok crap. actually down. finding yeah, out Korok exactly. again. They get that disruption, and yeah, that skewer just doing too much. It, what, the, what that is is a trade-off. If you rotate your supports mid, you can get the kills there at the cost of the fact that the offlane hero will get XP. But I mentioned that you want to look to where both offlane heroes are. Maus see that Koikwa is actually doing pretty well in his lane. Uh, so far, he has he is already halfway through level two, and this means that they feel a little more comfortable letting Bulba get more XP if they keep Korok down. Because as important as Bulba is to the game plan, Korok is even more so. And two deaths already on him means a 
Fata will have no issue hitting his levels. He's level four already. Yeah. B, they'll have the the they'll delay the timing at which TL is really dangerous. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. I mean, Korok is really, really his big limitation on Storm is that until level six, he has no real escape mechanism. He walks as slow, uh, has like an invoker. I mean, he just really can't really 20. escape on out. And in this position here, a couple of supports go a long way to make sure Fata has full control of this lane. Moving in towards level five, his shockwaves Bulba. will do a ton of damage. And we do see the Bulba's in a rough spot with that soul catcher active, but a nice cogs will uh, put them in a spot where they have to go all the way around, and despite the disruption holding him in place a little bit, he will be able to walk on out. Uh, probably won't pop off the Sal, but he will have to play cautiously until his HP gets a little bit uh, to a safer value here. But Korok, in the meantime, is finding a small opportunity, a small reprieve, where he will get 100% uh, experience. There aren't too many denies right now coming out of Fata, and instead Korok is going to be able to move in towards level 4, and he desperately needs that 6. Sure. I mean, this is the thing about Magnus. It, when it's just one versus one, he can't effectively pressure you until he hits reverse polarity. Like, it would be strange if Korok was losing the lane just in terms of last hits, because it's one thing for Magnus to actually find his farm just by spamming Shockwave, and it's quite another thing for him to somehow walk all the way up, get denies, etc., etc., because it's a lot of harassment that he cops every time he does that. Yeah. Now, one big thing on bottom lane, using a Centaur and Ice Mike stuns, as well as an Open Wounds, they were able to bring down Koikua's bear, so that's going to be on cooldown for 75 seconds. I 100 gold bounty did go to the life stealer, so TC already starting himself off very, very nicely here. Actually, at pretty much even GPM with Black, kind of going back and forth, last hit for last hit. But it's definitely uh, where he needs to be. Uh, he's not going to be necessarily able to take him when it comes down to like the 50 or 60 minute mark. But until that point in time, life still is an extremely powerful carry with a lot of damage potential that will be able to ignore most of the disables, other than I guess Chronosphere, Reverse Polarity, and Entangle, which actually add up pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. It looks like they might actually bring this tower down. Maus would have to rotate, I think, more than they want to to, to get this saved. So this is almost certainly a tower down, actually. Yeah, and uh, the problem is they don't have like a Keeper Light or something to rotate right now. They have a Rubik and a Shadow Demon. Great supports and a gank-oriented mindset, but as far as counter push, they don't bring anything to the table here. So that is going to set it up. Chen can do pretty much all he wants. Korok in mid lane is pulling Electric Vortex onto Fata, but this Shockwave, as well as more right-click, will seal his fate. So Fata just going in, knowing that how, much, how little HP he has to work with and uh, has that regeneration room to bring him right back up to full uh, which uh, I have to mention one thing after Paul does take a fall too much damage coming on out and a high roll to test the face as well as some good stuns uh, does bring him down as well but uh, I gotta say uh, Right now, Liquid isn't really playing reactively like we'd normally see them. They don't want to carry TP scrolls, they just want to kind of bull rush onto the towers here. And it's great to have objective, it's great to have focus, and I think with the tower kill, that, that one for one, uh, in a way, exchange, is definitely worth it there, but it does make it more and more difficult for Korok. He's going to be their weak link. Uh, Bulba is actually lower in level technically, uh, but as far as the expectations that comes out when right. he was up against the tri lane, I I'd say that's, that's understandable and that's something that he can work around. Whereas Korok, he isn't going to be able to steamroll, he isn't going to even be able to give too, give too much traction early as far as his early game momentum if he doesn't hit 6 and he doesn't get something big. But just reverse park. polarity committed and the skewer to bring him on out. Pause does do the telekinesis early so the ball lightning will come out. He just barely hit level 6. That timing, the creeps died on the tower while that was going on. And Korok was able to get ball lightning, only has 20 experience to spare, but he was able to get that cast off. And uh, in part, that is due to the fact that the telekinesis came out while uh, I believe Korok was still stunned up. Didn't want to let him go, but in the end, he still will be able to escape. But he will be forced back to base as he's on such low life right here. Actually, a pretty big deal that he didn't die. Uh, that's time for Poss wasted, and Korok does finally hit a 6, which is the main thing that... Uh... Maus were seeking to deny. The, the reason why I think there wasn't that much rotation is Liquid want to solidly win this lane and completely take map control of the, sort of this area of the map. Because what that means is that Koikwa, to find his farm after that, has to sort of encroach on Blacksville, as it were, like the area where Black is farming. And it, that technically means that Black is going to lose out on some of that farm, which Liquid want because it, it you know it delays Black's timings very very substantially. Mm -hmm. Actually, Quick so in a bit of trouble here. Yeah, actually, Ice Mike does get brought up out of smoke, but he's still under, right underneath the trees. Here comes that first stun coming on out. The impale starts off, and now yeah, there's the center as well. Test of Faith and Mana Burn to finish him off. And my goodness, Quick <laughs> is having a rough game right now. I was talking to you about the Storm Spirit being a weak link in this circumstance, but this lone Druid Radiance is zero one and zero, but attack. he's lost his bear multiple times. He's only sitting at level four, and uh, he's not going to be in a great spot to do any kind of split pushing or uh, tower presence so once like you said liquid starts gaining map control down here they're not going to be really losing it for an extended period of time right they 
the, the ability to get this side of the map for them is big for Liquid, and it's sort of, it's kind of the backup plan, as it were, because the first plan was for Korok to do better, but uh, they would have wanted to do this regardless, and it is very, very good news. I, I honestly think it about balances out the negative impact of the Storm having a slow start. So I would, I would call the game more or less even right now, just in terms of are the teams getting their game plans done. Both teams are substantially advancing big portions of their plan, so Magnus Fata is actually the most leveled person on the map. That's no small thing. He has his arcade boots and is on the way to blink. Mm -hmm. uh, and Maus is getting good farm on black. The flip side being they won't have this big Koikwa shield that can generate good counter pushing for another while yet. Yeah. Meanwhile, for Liquid, you know, uh, TC's doing great. They've completely dominated this lane. They've got good map control. But the flip side is that Korok isn't quite important yet. Yeah, most definitely. Now, an interesting thing to point out here is in this matchup between the Magnus and the Storm Spear here, we would assume that Magnus would be severely dominating. I mean, he's gotten so much help, so many kills on Storm, but Korok keeps farming away. Looking at CS, he's actually just about on point with him, 37 and 11 versus Magnus's 40 and 4. Why do you think Fata doesn't really have this kind of level, this uh, CS advantage comparatively? Uh, well, with Magnus, you do have to play fairly conservatively if you don't know where uh, Chen and Nyx Assassin are, because you can get completely picked off, unless maybe if you get a good RP, but even then you're you're not likely to actually catch Chen with his creeps. So he has to play a little more conservatively. He's only farming with Shockwave, really, and he's obviously not going to get denies, so unless he's going for a kill on Quark. I mean, here we go, exactly this. This yeah. is the problem. Going on in, River Polarity comes out onto two. He's going to use it to disengage with a rank three skewer. He will get up to the high ground, even popping off a Shockwave and a Fade Bolt to send a little bit of damage the other direction. But as you said, uh, although he was, had to play cautiously, he had to commit his River Polarity. At least he still survives. Right. I mean, he, he, when he has RP, it's okay, because he's likely to at least live, if not turn it around. But uh, once he actually pops the RP, it can just happen again. Again, their vision isn't great. They finally got this ward up here. But before that, uh, Mouse had actually no ward, so they had no idea of anything that happens west of here, unless TC's in range of the jungle. Yeah, most definitely here. So... Right now, we do see that there is a 750 gold advantage for Liquid, but the experience is going just the other direction. About the same uh, amount, the same magnitude, but it is going in favor of Mouse Sports here. We do see Magnus' Smoke getting dispelled, but Ix Mike doesn't see them out yet. Rating Vision just now giving them perspective. They go for Telekinesis and Disruption simultaneously, but it's still, one way or another, going to set up that. Oh, Big Impale after the Carapace is going to turn around nicely. Alex taking a lot of damage, and now hey, there is the Ensnare <laughs> coming on out as well. With Korok and TC coming around, they're turning around beautifully on Brata. Uh, hand of God, just to make sure everybody's popped up nice, safe, and sound as they take out three for zero. That was crazy good for them. The issues with that engagement, Mouseboard stacking up two big disables with decent cooldowns on Ike's Mike before they could even skewer him out of position. Immediately popping off the carapace and following up with the double impale, pretty much Mouse were dead in the water. They had nothing to do after that. Mouse handed that to Liquid, honestly. They didn't have great vision of where they were going. They really thought they'd find Korok in the trees and not IX Mike. And then once they once they th saw that it was IX Mike, they were like, eh, better than nothing. But it honestly wasn't much better than nothing because they popped, especially the skewer, I think. That's honestly the most important thing. The fact that they spent the skewer on IX Mike in addition to the other single target disables meant that if anybody rotated, Mouse had absolutely no response to it. And of course, they were right under the tier 1 tower, so mm -hmm. the odds of somebody not coming to help IX Mike were like, Liquid would have had to... There'd be some serious saltiness in the clubhouse if that didn't happen. <laughs> most definitely, most definitely. Now, I was just talking about the experience, but we see it swinging completely the other direction. Now we're moving it towards uh, 2k in favor of Liquid. Three kills, I mean, especially on a hero such as a solo mid, Fanta. It's really, really great for them. And now, uh, since they have that under control, they've shut down Quokwa pretty hard uh, just by putting pressure out with roaming supports. And now that they've kind of handily uh, dis uh, uh, dealt with the Bagness and the supports, they still have to worry about that reverse polarity. But as far as his blink timing it has been delayed as much as they kind of feel that it needs to be so pretty much the last one on their their checklist here is black do you think there's any feasibility for them to actually get a chance to initiate and uh, put some pressure out on that top lane Ooh, it would be really tough it's going to require a pretty serious rotation the nice thing for liquid actually fluff is still having some connection issues yeah, yeah that's unfortunate because uh, if you consider his positioning here I means right next to the tier two this gives opportunity for mouse sports to plan it out yeah they can't move their cameras during the pause but it's still a uh, uh, it's just a brief pause, so I guess it's not going to be that big of a deal. Either way, if Mouseports want to retaliate, they have RP, they have Chronosphere, and 
yeah, Fata's in an okay position. He's not going to get uh, his initiation d uh, screwed over. And so if they want to go in on this, uh, they just have to worry about Bulba's hookshot to really, really... Because a hookshot plus cogs uh, is going to be able to separate the team fight nicely. But again, uh, we have to see how many they want to commit to bottom lane here, or if they're just going to fall back and make sure that nobody dies. Because uh, TPs do get staggered out, and although all three uh, heroes on the top lane have one available, it's still going to take a little bit of time for them all to kind of rally the troops and, and get down into a position where they can fight this. If Mouse put everybody here, I think they could win this fight. But I also suspect that Liquid is not going to think this is their cross to die on either. They may just try to either uh, carefully pick the tower off primarily with Chen creeps and back off from there, or just leave the tower and back off. Uh, in a, a big engagement, I think, is only feasible if Boba lands a perfect hook shot and they pick people off as they come in. I actually think neither team really wants a fight here. Mm -hmm. So even, even if Liquid sort of decide to aggressively pressure the tower, I suspect Black is definitely not going to move over. Um, I think he's going to stay here until he at least farms up the Battle Fury. Okay. I'm not sure what Poss and Alex are thinking, obviously, uh, but in a 4-on-4, four four, I actually don't necessarily favor Maus right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they don't have the Rubik Spell Seal. They don't even have the Demonic Purge. So as far as their chase potential, it seems rather limited. It's going to have to be a clutch RP by Magnus, but he has a lot to work through. He has a lot to cut through with these neutral creeps in this position here. Fluff and stuff might be a quick and easy pickoff, but he doesn't even have Hand of God right now. He's not the most relevant of picks. The worst thing for him is that he'll be losing out on his mech money, which he's so darn close to it right now actually only like 21 gold away 21 seconds this pause issue happening wouldn't matter what whatsoever but in this position here uh getting disconnected right next to the tower and being only 21 gold shy that's uh, got to be a little bit frustrating here but hopefully they get it resolved to a point where they can uh, actually engage on this in a a good and uh well intended fashion i suppose mm. Interesting, I think the rest of TC's armlet is actually being delivered on Cluckles the Brave here. So this is actually a pretty big deal. Lifestealer, once he hits that armlet, timing just becomes so much stronger. Again, I think this speaks to the fact that in a 4-on-4 four four fight, Liquid are pretty favored. Yeah, they're, they're peeling. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Either they're waiting for the next creep wave or they're just going to peel back here. Well, they have the armlet now. They actually go for the infest. Ooh. The Cluckles was able to deliver it here. So Bubble actually going to go onto the top lane. This could be a big... I was talking about the pickoffs on top. And with this hook shot and uh -oh. the lifestealer now TPing on behind him is the Nyx Assassin. He goes for that time leap. Is enough distance? Ooh. It is. Ike's Mike cannot lock down that stun. With the hook shot hitting onto pause, they are going to be able to take one for this. Not the one they wanted, but they still are going to be able to at least claim something here. Uh, on the other lanes, nothing really happening. So they were able to pretty much get that kill scot free. There was an RP attempt from Magnus but he was able to cancel it out, knowing Korok had the opportunity to ball lightning on out. Bulba trying to get the regen room, but instead, <laughs> Magnus skewers on to pick it up himself. Nice cogs from Bulba, but still, it's going to go the way of Fanta here, and he's happy to acquire that for himself. Slough at the bottom down is probably bottom, He's so slow with that time of walk at number three, and now with this Chronosphere popped on off, that is no chance for him at all. So right. he's easy pick off for him, and that is actually putting some points on the board for Black, which is a big deal. One zero zero faces Void uh, is actually putting himself in a position where he He'll have a good Battle Fury timing, not just, uh, actually not just a good Battle Fury timing, a great Battle Fury timing, considering he also had to go for treads. Right, this is great for Black, it looks like it's, does he have anything on the Courier? It's probably going to be something like a 15-ish minute Battle Fury, which is certainly not bad. Um, actually a really good escape from that uh, Bulba gank there, TC was effectively baited out, mm -hmm. he actually uh, hit the Infest when Black was already out of range. So that was pretty substantial for Black to actually escape from that. They lose Poss, of course, but, I mean, having your Rubik die instead of your Faceless Void is like... If you play the Dota 2 RPG, you know that uh, <laughs> that's the job of a good support. Sure enough, sure enough. It's pretty much it's a lot of self-sacrifice here. And I kind of just look you know, on that note, looking at the net worth here, we're actually seeing it kind of atrocious for Mouse's supports. Uh, Paws is sitting at 865, 700... Uh, for the Shadow Demon Alex. He does actually get a disruption here up on top to try to help pause out a little bit, but TC, nice body block coming into the only position that he can walk on out of instead, getting an easy right click kill. Black without uh -oh. Chronosphere is on the run, has a TP scroll, but has to get a great time walk here. The stuns come out, the mana burn as well, but here comes Magnus trying to close on in, instead gets Cog on, and he doesn't have the skewer available. Cog out in a terrible position twice over, tries to commit the RP, but he still falls before anything can happen here, and that is really, really unfortunate for them. They don't pretty much have a leg to stand on if they want to go aggressive on this top lane meaning that the bottom mid lane will get pushed in the tier two mid will pro or sorry tier one mid will probably fall 
And, uh, yeah, Fata can't do anything about it, sitting in the grave for another 20 seconds. Yeah, you can't get cogged three times like that. The drain is frankly no joke, even at level 1. It was a lot of health lost solely due to the cogs, as well as mispositioning Fata. That's one of the, the big problem for Maus, I would actually say, is the levels on the supports. They need that steal and that purge quick like, in my opinion. Uh, especially once Lifesteal actually hits Armlet, you really want your Shadow Demon to be already level 6 so you can sort of do that pseudo-disable. And Rubik Steel, of course, there's all sorts of good stuff. Even in a game like this where there's no RP or Black Hole, uh, Rubik is a tier 1 pick for a reason. Pretty much no matter what he steals, it can be very effective. Actually, another gank, so get Liquid putting on the pressure. Yep, Korok going with the ball, lighting on to Alex here. Doesn't get Telly, but too much damage coming out. Alex does go for a nice defensive disruption, but with this Remnant to pop off as soon as he comes on out, just waiting for him here. Black going for possibly another Chronosphere. Gets a Bash proc, might not need it, but that Ensnare, yeah, no mana on the Troll Summoner, so he can actually just go in, but no, Bulba comes out the Infest as well, bursting wow. him down in a matter of seconds, shredded up. Beautiful hook shot. I mean, it wasn't the hardest, but it definitely was the one they needed there. Oz Magic wanting to delay some TC damage, but he's still going to keep his right clicks going. The RP was canceled out once more. It still has yet to commit one more or anything more than a solo on to Korok. So they still have this RP available, but it hasn't been a real threat in the sense he has yet to cast it. So they're going to walk away from this. They pick off Black uh, for the first time this entire game, and that's a big, big deal. Absolutely. The kill on Black is huge because he hasn't hit his Battle Fury yet. And actually, I mean, we said he was close, but he's he's not that close. He's made no material progress towards it in the last two minutes or so, unfortunately. And it's not like bad. He's like anti mage. It's not like once he gets Battle Fury, he's suddenly Korok amazing. On Magnus pops off Necronomicon with that stun already out. There goes the Skewer, but he puts Korok right on top of him. RPs him under tower. It was his intention here, but TC is at his back. There is the stun. Will hit, but a nice defensive disruption will actually negate the damage. Their ball lightning on in, and one more right All he needs, and with that uh, armlet and the oh, wounds, he will be able to bring him down. But the Chronosphere dish now damage on Korok. TC drop into tower. They both will fall. No, the Infest comes out at least for now. Uh, but he is on such low life, he will be able to bring himself back up to about half HP with the infestation, but uh, it's still going to put him in a really rough spot being in 2 versus 4 right here. No, I think he, they ran away, or Maus went a little too far to actually punish TC on the D, on the D infest. Yeah, uh, so, I'm amazed yeah. Alex didn't de Demonic Purge right there, is the, the one thing I was looking at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I'm not sure, I mean they didn't have Chronosphere. They didn't actually have any real damage to follow up with Quaqua not there and Fata not there. I mean, Black is still... I wouldn't say, like, he's his hits are like a limp noodle, but they're in the noodly sort of sphere still until he gets... Like I was saying, it's not just the Battle Fury. You need Battle Fury and the next thing. And so Liquid's job is to A, delay the Battle Fury, which they've done, and B, just push a lot and do really hard pressure on them before whatever the next thing happens to be. Coming up I do three versus three, starting yeah. off on to pause Positive. with that vendetta strike. He is obliterated with a rocket to clean it on up. They're gonna be able to walk away from here. They're still technically three versus three, but with a fluff not too far behind, mechanism and hand of God coming up and available. That is gonna make it so that they can pretty much hold this position no matter what, because now their verse polarity is actually on cooldown. Like he hasn't been using it, yeah. he's just been canceling out, but but this time around he has actually has it expired and has to wait for it to come back up and available. But uh as far as that damage output, is there like a flow chart I need to know about where like there's a noodley category and uh, <laughs> uh I'm developing one place. I'm, <laughs> I'm planning can't, to release can't wait it. To see it. <laughs> I'll make some YouTube promos for it when it's done. Uh, I mean, I honestly think the support levels are a huge problem for Maus. They're like three levels behind where the TL supports are at, and this means that the Rubik and Shadow Demon just die almost instantly at the beginning of a fight, and that's not something you really, I mean, it's, it's not something you want in the best of circumstances, but in this case, they need to do so much screening and setup for for Black, for Koikwa, that they can't just have Alex and uh, Paws getting in. Off. With that infest up and Paws' yeah. quick easy pick off here, no TP rotation uh, actually would be very wise not to jump on into this mess here, but without this fortification, do you think they can just take the tier 2 right here and now? Yeah, easily. I I mean, if you're Maus, what do you feel about this? Like, are we going to just put more people into the meat grinder? I guess Fonta actually Magnus. is invisible. They have an Invis Magnus. They want yeah, to look okay, at this here. Good. The, the tor double tornado actually is a, quite a deterrent for them to try to hold the line in this position here. But with TC being skewered back on Anchor, maybe RP on him solo, they're going to have to burn him down very, very quickly. At least get entangled. But here comes Black looking for that Chronosphere. Doesn't pop it. There it goes. On to two. On to the Wild Wings as well. But Stun, Clark, disabling him for the duration. TC will get dropped. No armlet toggle for him. But IX Mike dishing out a lot. Disable Black is the target of choice, but that time lock 
will put him out of it. The hook shot not getting the vector to finish him off, and so PAS is the only casualty here, along with Koikla's Lone Druid. There is going to be the hook and shot. The Cogs will trap him in as well. Bata should drop here, but two seconds left on that skewer. Wants to pop it off. Will try, and he will actually get it off technically, but uh, to no avail, he still falls, and the tier two drops with him. Uh, I don't know. I mean, an Invis Magnus is one thing, but like they made it, they could not have made it any more obvious that they had an invisible Magnus. Like, Black and I think uh, Koyoko were just slow walking towards TC. Like, hmm, I wonder why these underfarmed heroes are confidently walking towards me. <laughs> and as a result, I mean, TC actually popped the rage off. Uh, right as he got skewered, so the RP didn't deal any damage, they had to commit a lot of damage to actually bring down TC, and by the time TC even died, Liquid were picking Maus apart, so, I don't know, I mean, it's always, when you have an Invis rune, you always want to use it, you don't just want to let it run down, but I don't know what Maus, like, how they mapped out the possibility of them winning that fight, especially when Liquid, like, clearly saw their bluff and was like, yeah, you probably have an invis guy and we're gonna spread out yeah i mean they they did all right in the sense that they kept the faces void alive black was able to survive on through that has had his battle fury for a little bit whereas tc was the one to take a fall at the very end he actually almost survived he was actually <laughs> like taking uh, during the final duration of a stun he took that last right click otherwise he could have ar actually armlet toggled and uh been able to turn things around nicely, but uh, not really how it works. But with Ike's Mike knowing this tier two is gone, no oh, detection, no. they have so Black. much map presence to jump on in and finish him off Black before he gets any chance at all. Yeah, he can time. He keeps on getting those uh, backtracks, but his mana is all burned. Now RP comes out on Ike's Mike, but he has that carapace up. Nobody can touch him, and he's actually just going to turn around on Fata. That uh, he does have the blink, but just a continuous amount of damage will be able to bring him down. Alex will drop first. Now looking to finish off Fata, and yeah, no hope for him whatsoever. So that was an easy, easy turnaround because Ix Mike was the only one carapaced up. Nice ball, uh, lightning, nice carapace, and yeah, Bulba finds the pick up on pause as well. They have this observer ward here. I'm not going to say this monster call the game because again, they do have that hard late game potential, but it's very, very bleak for them, and I don't know if they can really make it to that point. Yeah, bleak is the word. Uh, also, Korok, I actually like this. This is very unusual that a Storm Spirit builds Necronomicon first, but it's just they're trying to seal the deal. Actually, Koiko is probably going to die too, for that matter. And that's basically a, a five dead for Maus in the last span of last minute and a half. Exactly, setting things up nicely. Bulba will actually just kind of goof around a little bit before being uh, <laughs> test of faith back on home. But uh, yeah, they were able to bring down the melee racks, got their objective there, and yeah, they took down all five, gradually, uh, as it may be, but nevertheless, very, very effectively. And yeah, I think the main mindset behind that Storm Spirit's Necro pickup, which, mind you, is now Necro freaking 3, uh, exactly. is the fact that it, it goes in conjunction with the Nyx Assassin's Mana Burn. It's a great item on the Nyx, uh, but Mike has been finding uh, so, so far. It's not been bad, but if he wants to prioritize a Blink Dagger or something like that, the Necro 3 is going to be way too delayed. So the Storm Spirit here, picking that up, uh, Korok will be able to burn mana with the melee attack of the Necro uh, Warrior, and then with the range one, they can actually do the mana burn active. So combining mm -hmm. that with mana burn, and suddenly you saw there, Black didn't have any mana to work with, even after his magic stick was popped. So right. in that situation, no casts, no escape, and uh, easy pickoffs there. So I think it was a really, really great pickoff and showing its worth right there. Yeah, and I was about to say that I actually would love to see a blink on Nyx, and we do see Ix Mike picking that up. He's quietly had a very, very good game. Some of the impales that he's hit have been just really huge, and he's probably going to get even more now that he actually has this blink dagger, because of course that gives Nyx so much more initiation ability, really can set the terms of a fight. It's going to be pretty bad hmm. for TC here, actually. They had only half them smoked up, so they know that something's nearby. They actually go in for the Chronosphere solo onto Korok, trying to burn him down before he can ball lightning. Hand of God keeps him up, but the telekinesis and... The Soul Captain will lock him down. No, he will survive long enough for Fata having to commit that reverse polarity. Uh, and from there, you, yes, you get Korok. Yes, you put him down for 50 seconds. He, yeah. Oh, God, Bulba coming in. They know they don't have anything. That's what I was working towards. The fact that no RP means no team fight. They don't have anything here. No Pro, no, no RP. Cleaning it up. Bulba goes for one more right click to finish off a Shadow Demon. Looking for Black as well, but he's a little bit in over his head by himself. Going on in. Fata gets pincered on in the trees. And in there, he won't be able to get on out. Forcing out the buyback in the test of base roll. No backtrack for you. It's going to be the death of Black here. And Take a Proc does come out on Bulba, but they're going up on the high ground. Boykwa is pretty much caught out here. He will be dropped as well. Tier 3 means nowhere to run, nowhere to hide, and they're just going to be able to finish this off. Good game, well played, Cole. Yeah. I mean, we were talking about Koikwa's bear still doesn't have armlet at 24 minutes, 
And this is what I said with Liquid's like backup plan. If the storm isn't immediately relevant, we can still win because we can delay the timing of the Lone Druid so much that Lone Druid plus Void won't amount to, you know, a hill of the fiends in this crazy Dota game. And that's exactly what they did. Koiko was so underfarmed and in such bad position to actually farm his lane safely that he doesn't have armlet, he doesn't bring any damage, and I mean, Mao's even in their wildest dreams weren't thinking that Black would be dominating the game at 24 minutes. And so if you don't have Lone Druid, what are you left with? Just RPs, and that's it. And Fanta just didn't happen to find the five-person RPs because Liquid were totally cognizant of the fact that the only danger at that point was RP. And if, if you don't have a lot to worry about, you can concentrate all your attention on good positioning. And I think that's what they did. Liquid's positioning was amazing in those games. Uh, they would always be basically doing two things, like in a fight. TC would be beating on one person, and that's probably the person that Korok would be hitting. And then the supports plus Bulba would be locking down another person. Or TC would be inside of Bulba, and them two would concentrate on one person. And then Storm, uh, Korok, IX, Mike, and Fluff would focus on another person. And that meant that uh, if you're Fata trying to figure out what to RP, it's you know it's like a, it's a difficult choice to make. It's like, well, do I RP to save that person? Do I RP to save that person? And either way, it's not the rampage RP that I want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of their very AOE centric spells were forced to be used in a single target sense. They had good escape mechanisms. They had good survivable heroes. And if they gave them an inch, they take a mile. They would be able to get Korok out of there with his ultimate. Nyx could cast off his impale and just run for the hills. Uh, I mean, Clockwork even has the chance to hook shot to an ally. I mean, all these guys have such great escapes that if you want to go for a kill in this situation, you have to work for it. You have to commit a lot to it. But as soon as those cooldowns are popped, as soon as that Chrono RP was a down, you could see how confident Bulba was to just stride on into the middle of things. He's like, okay, they have some right-click damage. I have a decent amount of armor, I'm farmed up nicely to the point that I'm level 13, and he just was in a position where he could just make things happen, everybody made things happen in this, uh, but in this situation, Bulba found some nice hook shots and had absolutely no fear in him because I don't think he got hit by a single reverse polarity, it was all focused on Korok and, and or TC, and in that situation there, it they, they was effective sometimes, but not nearly as much as it needed to be, so uh, the my, one thing I was talking about in the drafting phase, Faces Void as a pickup for Black. Is there any other carry that you think could have done more in this situation? Uh, I wouldn't. I, I mean, we commented on Alchemist at the time. I wouldn't have minded seeing that. But just in general, I feel like Liquid just sort of out, outsmarted Mao's in the drafting phase. They knew. It seemed like they knew right from the beginning what Mao's draft was basically going to be. And they just drafted against that right from the beginning. So Mao's may have positioned themselves. By the point at which they hit the fourth and fifth pick, they already, as we mentioned, had to put Koikwa on the Lone Druid. They couldn't just put Black on the Lone Druid and have something else for Koikwa, just because there wasn't really that much left in the pool. Maybe Windrunner or something, I don't know. And so uh, I think by the time they had to pick a hero for Black, there weren't that many great choices left. Maybe the Alchemist, uh, it does get to a, a relevant point faster. I think the stun could have done some work, but I honestly don't know. I, I, hon I just feel like they sort of didn't, Right from the beginning, their draft wasn't going that great just because Liquid effectively predicted. I think the second ban phase was when it started turning bad. Yep. Well, that's going to be it here. It's a 24 and a half minute win uh, going towards Team Liquid here. I mean, the Chen doing work early game with the towers, but really the follow through with Korok, TC, Bulba, and Mike just staying on top of things here. Uh, no, no disregard to Fluff. He did put out some good heals, but I really think it was Nyx's Assassin starting things off nicely with good uh, ballsy initiation. He was fearless about Sentry Wards, just jumping on in, getting pickoffs on the supports, and the follow-through was really great. Bulba landing some great hooks. Korok always being able to bounce back. He had a really, really rough early game in the lane, but he did really, really nicely as well. So props to Liquid all around. And uh, that's going to be it for game one. But, of course, this is a best of three series here. So we're going to check out game two of Liquid vs. Mouse when we come back. Thanks for tuning in, on, guys. And uh, if you guys enjoyed the commentary, I'm Blaze, and this is Vikramond. If you're interested in my commentary, you can check out twitter.com slash blazecasting. That's where I generally post up all of my uh, activities otherwise. And uh, for you, Vic. Oh, uh, anywhere you can find my name, basically. V-Y-K-R-O-M-O-N-D. Uh, Twitch, Twitter, YouTube.com, whatever. Sounds good, sounds good. All right, going on to the next one, guys. Thanks for tuning in.